Okay. Uh, title is variability basics. So this is going to be building uh, on top of what we uh, covered last time. Um, so the, the idea is now we, we study uh, some of the, the basics in terms of how to measure uh, or how to um, well measure is one way of saying it, um, diagnose or quantify the performance of a manufacturing line. Um, and using that information, we were able to um, decide whether or not the performance of the manufacturing line was between a, the expected, um, well, we, we were able to split the, the area of performance in three. Uh, we will have an area where there's a lot of fat that shows that worst performance. We have a practical uh, worst performance measurement and then the, the green area in which we are um, showing that the performance is good. Uh, so if you have the assignment with you, please submit it. Uh, we are going to uh, get started with the next lecture. Yes, sir. Go get it, yeah. Um, and this new topic is called variability, variability basics. So, so far, in, in our analysis, we were assuming that the, the performance and the variability was not taken into account, meaning that we were assuming that the performance was given by deterministic uh, numbers. Say, okay, we know the processing time is going to be this much. And using that information, we can compute some of the of these um, performance matrix uh, measurements. So today we're going to start accounting for, for this uh, additional uh, aspect, which is called the variability. Also today, I'm going to spend some time talking about the, um, the project. So in this class, we have a, a project that is a um, semester long project. And I have posted the, the instructions. I think I posted them yesterday. So we're going to spend some time talking about those uh, instructions today. So let's get started. So the agenda for today, we're going to look at the introduction in terms of variability. Uh, what is variability and randomness? Process time variability, the causes of variability, flow variability, uh, characterizing the variability in flows, and also we're going to discuss demand variability and flow variability. So um, as an introduction, we discussed a uh, little slow last time. Um, we know that the throughput equals the working process divided by the cycle time, which is the same as working process equals uh, throughput times cycle time. So based on the little slow, some same product or some same throughput can be obtained with a large WIP or working process, long cycle time, or small working process in a short cycle time. Okay, so if you if you look at the parameters of this equation, we can we can see that if both of these numbers are high and both of these numbers are low, we can get the, the same throughput as a measurement, right? If we, if we look at the, we use the right numbers, we can, we can see that, right? Low, low, high, high, 
division is a division, right? So we, we can uh, find the same throughput. So that's what the statement is saying. So the same throughput can be obtained with large uh, working process or small working process with short cycle time. So what is the difference? The difference is variability. Okay, so when you start, start taking into account the variability in the process, that's what you start seeing that a large working process might result. Let's say you have some, um, some machines that are failing that are creating delays that will increase also your cycle time. So if your machine has failed, you might not be able to produce, you will have a big queue in front of your machine, working process is gonna increase at the same time, cycle time is going to increase because you're not gonna be able to complete those parts as fast as you would like. Um, so that's why this can happen. Variability is taking part of, of these equations. When we talk about the penny fab one, show that achieves full throughput, 0.45 jobs an hour. When we have a critical wave equal to four jobs, if it behaves like the best case, but requires a working process of 27 jobs to achieve a 95% of capacity if it behaves like the practical worst case. Problem, why is that the case? Again, variability. If you have a variability into your system, then you know that these deterministic best case scenarios are not going to be the ones that you're going to uh, be uh, encountering. So that's the lecture today. We want to start account for this variability into our processes and see how those or, or that variability impact the performance of our system. And we're gonna look at uh, an example just to illustrate uh, this uh, point, the impact of variability. We're gonna have two machines. They're subject to the same workload, which is 69 jobs a day or 2.875 jobs an hour. And both of them are subject to unpredictable outages. Okay, so both of them are going to be available about 75% of the time. But there's a difference between when are these outages are going to happen. So the two machines have different names. Those are the ones that I'm showing here in color. We have, uh, the X19, and the here X19, and we have the T2000. For the hair X19, we have long but infrequent outages. And for the torch walls, we have the short, more frequent outages. So we'll see that this make an impact, makes a difference in terms of the performance of the manufacturing line. We will see, we will show which one of these two cases is more um, beneficial for your system. Is it better to have long but infrequent outages or is it better to have short, more frequent outages? And we'll show that with numbers. Um, the performance shows that the X19 is substantially worse on all measurements than the Torch was 2000. The answer for this question, variability. So the performance is gonna show that X19, even though it has long but infrequent outages, it will be performing worse than the one that has more outages but that are shorter in time. So let's, let's build the knowledge to understand how can we quantify that in terms of uh, performance. So let's start with discussing what's variability. And in this class, we, we study variability from two points of view, right? We, we are looking at the theory behind, uh, in terms of manufacturing uh, lines. And we are also looking at it from the modeling perspective. So when we build these uh, arena models in this class, we observe that we are dealing with these probability models that are representing the, the uncertainty in the system and the variability in the system. But for now, we're gonna be focusing on these um, equations. So variability is any departure from uniformity. Okay, so if you, you're looking at uh, a machine producing a part every five minutes, 
if you deviate from that uniformity, then you know that there's some variability happening into your process. Uh, it's closely associated, but not identical to randomness. It's not the same thing, okay? Um, controllable variation occurs as a direct result of the sessions. So for example, different products will require different color restrictions. So that's something that you can control. A random variation is a consequence of events beyond our immediate control. So for example, uh, the times between customer demands. You know that if you're selling a product, you might get some demand for your product, but you don't know, and you cannot control the customer demand. Those are gonna happen randomly and you have to plan for those. So there's variation that you can control and there's variation that is random. Um, so we are dealing with probability models um, when you're trying to accommodate or study vari variability, typically rely on these uh, probability models. Um, and we should have, and we all have this, what we call probabilistic intuition. So intuition plays an important part in many aspects for our everyday lives. For example, um, driving a car, throwing a ball, mastering the store market. We, we have some type of intuition saying, okay, maybe if I drive in the morning, if I go at this time, I'm not gonna find any traffic. But if I go at this time and I'm gonna be uh, looking at a long uh, driving time period because there's gonna be a lot of traffic. Um, stock market, same thing. If you, if you understand how stocks behave, you're following a company, you have some intuition of what can happen, what cannot happen. So our intuition is good with respect to first order effects. And what that means is um, looking at the impact, like a cause effect, right? So I do this, I see the impact. So those are the first moment effects. So for example, throughput increases with machine speed. So we know if we, um, if we have a constant arrival, if we increase the speed of a machine, we can be able to produce more parts, right? So that's that's a first moment effect. We have our intuition can tell us that. Also throughput increase with availability. So if we have more machines available, more operators available, and we bring more parts into the system, we should have a higher throughput. Inventory increases with lot size. So as we produce more units, more lot, the lot size is greater. Uh, inventory should increase. So those are intuition. This is good with respect to first order effects. Um, so this type of intuition typically comes from acting as a, the world were deterministic without randomness. So basically we are assuming that nothing is going to impact X, Y, Z, right? We know for sure that if we come to class at two o'clock, Dr. Perez is gonna be here teaching the class. That's, that's our intuition telling us that. But maybe I have a situation I'm not showing up. That could be a random event. You might come here, I might not be here. So that's the difference. In the language of probability and statistics, such reasoning is based on the first moment or the mean, average of the random variables involved, okay? However, our intuition tends to be less developed for second moments. Uh, those second moment events involve variance, so the uncertainty, which is more variable processing times or parts or batches. We don't know, we're gonna have to go look at what's happening and then measure and see what the conclusion is, which are more disruptive, long and frequent failures or short frequent ones. Yeah, again, you have to take into account the variability to be able to make a decision. Our intuition is less secure for second moments and misinterpretation typically is used, <clears throat> such as regression of the mean, trying to uh, predict what's gonna happen based only on the mean. So that could be lead to misinterpretation. So in this class, in this lecture, we are going to treat to and I try to add, add this component, this second moment effects into our performance prediction for manufacturing processes. 
And we're gonna start with this, uh, what we call process time variability. So uh, variability again is anything that causes the system to depart from regular predictable behavior. And here's a list of, of uh, sources of variability from a manufacturing point of view. Uh, we can have variability in the setup. So depending on who is performing the setup, uh, also if the parts are available uh, on the right place, um, if we know for sure which products are going to be processed and so on. So the setups are the source of variability, the failures of the machines, uh, material shortages, we don't have enough product, yield loss, defects, rework, operator unavailability. So if someone is not showing up, uh, work phase variation, we have different workers, different skills, uh, differential skill levels, engineering change orders. So maybe um, the customer wants to add something to the product, uh, customer orders, product differentiation, and the material handling. So anything connected to the process, material handling, if you have a conveyor that is failing, or if you have a forklift that is uh, damaged something in your production floor, all those things can be sources of variability. So to effectively analyze variability, we must be able to quantify it. Okay, so we're gonna start looking at these um, parameters to try to quantify the, the variability. So I'm gonna start writing this on the board so we can keep track of them. I would advise you to do the same thing. Like if you keep a piece of paper, but there's gonna be a lot of them. So, So T is the mean process time of a job. Sigma E is the standard deviation. of the process time. And then we have the coefficient of variation, which is equal to the standard deviation divided by the mean process time. So this is the coefficient of variation. Or C. As a note here, we often use the square coefficient of variation, SCV, which is equal to C squared, or the coefficient of variation squared. So a random variable has low variability. If the coefficient of variation, the C, is between or is less than 0.75. Okay, so the typical situation to be process time without outages. Um, a random variable has moderate variability if the coefficient of variation is between 0.75 and 1.33. Uh, so this could be a process time with short adjustments or setups. And then high variability if the CV is better than 1.33. Those are, for example, situations in which you have process time with long outages or failures. So those are three areas that, or three um, parameters that we can use to quantify the type of variability that we are observing. Um, so here are the variability classes in factory physics. Again, we are just setting those in, in color now. And the uh, effective process time 
is the actual process time. Uh, typically, those are uh, low variability. Uh, the effective process times include setup, failure, outages, um, high variability, low variability, and moderate variability are all possible in effective process time. The relation to performance cases for balanced systems, model, um, model variability is associated with the practical worst case. Low variability is between best case and practical worst case, and high variability is between practical worst case and uh, the worst case. So here we are, have an example. We're trying to um, measure the type of, of variability for these three machines. And we are collecting um, <clears throat> we are collecting uh, information. We have 15 trials here, and we are collecting, let's say, the processing time for each one of these machines. And we observe that for the first machine, we have uh, numbers that don't change as much. You have numbers between 22 and 30. For machine number two, most of the numbers are less than 10, but then we have three numbers that are higher than 30, 35, 45, and 50. And for machine three, we have the same numbers as machine number two, with the exception of trial number 12, in which we have a 500. And the numbers in terms of the mean process time of a job, the standard deviation of the processing time and the coefficient of variation are listed here for each one of them. So for machine one, here are the performance, machine two, and machine three. You can see um, for each one of them, um, we, we have established the type of variability class, right? So for the first one, we observe that that coefficient of variation is 0.1, so that can be classified as low variability. For the second one, moderate variability. Um, and for the third one, it's higher than 1.33, so it's high variability. But we still have questions. So for example, is this, are these measurements accounting properly for an observation that is clearly an outlier? Here. This is something that is an outlier. The rest of the observations are clearly different than this number. So these type of measurements are telling you that because you have an outlier, you are going from modern variability to a high variability. So this is not these type of measurements are not accounting properly for these type of events. So Question that is, um, after we observe these numbers is, can we really measure this coefficient of variation in this way? The answer is no, because it is not taking into account these rare events properly. Okay, so we need better way, a better way to account for this uh, type of variability. So we are gonna look into that, but before we get into details, I want to start looking at the different type of variabilities or causes of variability. So first we have what we call the natural variability. And these are the type of uh, events or um, things that will impact your, your process but they don't have explicitly analyzed cause. So for example, variability inherited in the natural processing time, which includes random downtimes, uh, which excludes random downtimes, setups, and any other external influence. For example, sources of natural variability can be the operator pace. So maybe you have an operator that is faster than another operator, but that's embedded into the process. Uh, material fluctuations, 
the product type if it is not explicitly considered and the product quality. Um, however, this type of variability typically is in the lower bound or lower variability category. Um, so we have some measurements here that are associated with the natural process time, uh, coefficient of variation. So again, we like to keep track of this, so we'll keep adding to this list. Now we have T0, which is the mean process time. Sigma zero and our deviation R zero is one over the mean process time, and this is named the base capacity. The rate parts an hour. And then we have the coefficient of variation for this natural variability, which is sigma zero divided by T zero. So this natural process time are only the starting point for evaluating effective process time. In real production systems, workstations are subject to various detractors such as uh, machine downtime and setup. So we're going to look into those as well. So let's look at those uh, variability from preemptive outages. Uh, most capacity planning tools used in industry account for random outages when computing average capacity. These are done by computing the availability, which is given in terms of the mean time to failure or MTTF and the mean time to repair, MTTR. And that availability is computed using this formula. So we have the mean time to failure divided by the mean time to failure plus the mean time to repair. Okay, so availability The mean time to failure <coughs> plus mean time to repair. The mean time to failure is the time that uh, lapsed between the last failure until the new one. And the mean time to repair is the time or the average time between the start and finish of the repair time. And so those are the two parameters. So availability is gonna be determined based on the mean time to failure and the mean time to failure plus mean time to repair. Uh, the effective mean process time we observe here, um, we can compute that also by looking at the mean process time divided by the availability. So we take the mean process time of a job, which is gonna be equal to the mean process time divided by the availability. And the effective capacity rate, Right this here, RE, effective capacity rate RE is going to be equal to M. M is the number of machines divided by TE 
which is equal to a times m divided by t zero, which is equal to a times r zero. R zero is the base time or the base capacity rate. Yes. T O. T zero. We were. Um, they're actually the same thing. T zero were used to define for the natural variability, um, but they're representing the the mean process time. So without, I mean, T0 is taking into account the, yeah, the natural variability. So this is the mean process time of a job. And T0 is the main process time uh, when considered the natural process uh, variability. Okay, so we now have these um, coefficients and performance uh, formulas to to help us address or compare these uh, different systems according to the impact of the variability. So if you remember, we started with this um, example. We go back to in which we were trying to show we have these two machines here, X19, that has low but infrequent outages, and the Tor 2000 that has short but more frequent outages. And the conclusion show that X19, even though has less outages, these are longer outages, but they're happening less frequently, that this X19 machine is worse on all measurements than this one that is having short but more frequent outages. You want to understand why. So we're going to use this uh, information, try to quantify that performance and show what's going on. Okay, so we're going to start with this uh, information. We have T0, we have uh, the, stand the mean process time, the standard deviation, uh, we also have the coefficient of variation uh, for the natural variability. We, ha we have the mean time to failure and the mean time to repair. Um, so if you show, if you look at both of them, mean time to failure is 12.4 hours. So every 12 hours, 12 and a half hours, we're going to have a failure. Um, and then the mean time to repair is about four, four hours. Uh, for this one, mean time to failure is two hours, almost two hours. The mean time to repair is about 40 minutes. And we also have, um, um, so we want to compute the availability for, for these two and see if there's any difference. Now that this one is being working for 12 hours and the repair is four hours, but this one, the, the repair time is less, but it's operating less time. So is there any difference between these two in terms of availability? Well, let's compute those numbers. Uh, we're gonna use the formula for the availability, which is mean time to failure divided by mean time to failure plus mean time to repair. So this is in terms of minutes, 744 divided by 744 plus 248. And this is equal to 0.75. And so for the X19, we have an availability of 0.75. If we do for the Tor 12, 2000, mean time to failure divided by mean time to failure plus mean time to repair. This is 114 
divided by 114 plus 38. So if you look at those numbers, they're no different. They're the same. So in terms of availability, they're being available the same amount of time based on these numbers. So there's no difference. Tier is the um, coefficient of variation of the repair. Yes. So, um, so in terms of these two, there's no difference between the Erase this because I have those numbers already in the slide. So it's going to look funny if I keep this. So both of them are 0.75. So there's no difference between machines in terms of availability. So availability is not, not the cost. And so let's look at the downtime variability effect. So the effective variability in show TE is the mean process time of a job. So that's going to be equal to the process time divided by the availability. And then we can compute the um, sigma. E squared by using this uh, formula, CE equals uh, this uh, standard deviation divided by the availability squared plus the multiplication of MR squared plus sigma R squared times one minus A times T zero, all that divided by AMR. So, the coefficient of variation, we saw that um, the square coefficient of variation is the square of sigma e divided by t e squared, right? So, so if you put these two, t e squared is going to be equal to t zero divided by a squared, and sigma e is this expression. If you solve for C E square, this is going to be equal to sigma E square divided by T E square. And the, so that means that you're going to take all this, you're going to put it here, and you're going to take this and you're going to put it here. And after solving that expression, you'll get this. Okay, so that's where this expression is coming from. Coefficient of variation squared. Something that I want you to see from this expression, you see there's a summation here. Uh, there's multiplication, but then I want you to pay attention to this uh, division that is happening here. This is telling us something. This is telling us that the variability depends on repair time in addition to uh, availability. Okay, so mean time to repair, if that number is this, then this whole coefficient is going to increase. That's what the, the expression is telling us, okay? So in addition to me, depending on the availability, that coefficient of variation is also highly dependent on that parameter um, mean time to repair. So in conclusion, failures inflate mean, variance and the coefficient of variation of effective process time. The mean time, um, mean T increases proportionally with one over A, the square coefficient of variation, C E squared, increases proportionally with the mean time to repair, as showing up here. 
Uh, the square coefficient of variation C also increases proportionally to the coefficient of variation of the repair, which is here also. So as you increase that number, this whole expression is going to increase. Uh, so for constant availability, long and frequent outages increase this square coefficient of variation more than short frequent ones. And it's because of that, because if you have long with uh, longer repair time, this is going to be increasing that um, whole expression in terms of the variability of your process. So for cost and availability, long and frequent outages increase the square coefficient of variation more than short frequent ones. So let's show that with some numbers. We can compute the effective um, mean process time of a job by looking at T0 divided by the availability. So for the X19, that's gonna be 15 over 0.75. So that's 20 minutes. For the torque force is 15 minutes also divided by 0.75. So it's also 20 minutes. The, coefficient, the square coefficient variation, we're using again this formula. So for this case, Z0 squared is 0 0.05, 1 plus 1, the availability is 0 0.75, 1 minus 0.75 mean time to repair divided by T0, all that gives you 6.25, which is high variability. For the torque force, um, you have Z0, 0 0.05, same values. Mean time to repair is 38 divided by 15. So the coefficient, the effective coefficient of variation square is 1.0, which is a moderate variability. So what this is showing you is that the X19 is much, much variable than the Tortuous 2000. So even though um, they have the same availability, since um, this guy right here, X19, is more variable, you should expect performance on that machine is to be uh, less or not as good as this one that is experiencing a lower or moderate variability. Okay, high variability, high unexpected events can happen that can affect your overall performance for the system. Um, so that is the conclusion. Here, X19 is much more variable than the Tortuos 2000. And that's why performance of the X19 is not as good as the performance of the Tortuos 2000. So what is the impact? So we, we have established that this this machine is less variable than this one. Okay, so how is that going to impact your performance? So the impact of variability, let's say both of them have the same arrival, uh, inter-arrival times, 2.87 jobs an hour. Uh, so we know that the X19 will exhibit more variability than the so how this effect affects the working process and the cycle time, we're going to focus on that aspect in our next lecture. But for now, we got to understand is there's a way for us to measure the variability of a process and we can determine whether or not uh, having certain amount of uh, mean time to failure, 
the mean time to repair and how that impacts our uh, variability in terms of processing of parts. And we are gonna discuss the impact of the variability in our next lecture. For now, I wanna add into our discussion, we're gonna focus that on the variability from non-preemptive outages. So the ones that we discussed earlier, we're focusing on the preemptive. Now we are gonna look at the non-preemptive outages. So these are downtimes that will inevitably occur for which we have some control as to exactly when. So for example, when a tool starts to become dull and needs to be replaced. We have control about that. We can perform that preventive maintenance and wait, not wait until that tool becomes uh, or fail. So we have some type of control over those non-preemptive outages. Processing universe setups can be regarded as non-preemptive outages when they occur due to changes in the production process as opposed as changes in the product. So there's some, some additional parameters here um, for the setups. So again, let me ask you this list. So now we're adding Non-preemptive outages focus on the setup. Um, so NS is the number of jobs between setup. Yes, is the set average setup duration. Sigma S equals the coefficient of variation for the setup. So this is sigma. Sorry, this is the coefficient of got confused. Sigma S is the standard deviation of the setup time. And then the coefficient of variation of the setup is equal to sigma s divided by ts. Um, so now we can compute that effective time or effective or mean process time of a job by taking into account that process time plus the time for the setup. Um, so let me put that in here. P equals P zero plus P S divided by N S and sigma E square equals sigma square zero, so the standard deviation plus sigma square of the setup number of jobs between setup plus NS minus one divided by NS squared squared. And finally, coefficient or the effective coefficient of variation squared is sigma squared the effective standard deviation and P so again, my advice is for you to start putting all this in a single uh, paper, like a formula sheet. You might be asked to bring one to, to the exam. So if you start putting it together now, it will save some time and it's gonna help you uh, with the assignments and to understand the material. So. So we have all this, uh, now we're taking into account the setups. Uh, so, so as you can see here, the setup, as you would expect, will inflate the average processing time because we are adding that additional time into the mean process time of a job. 
the variability effect in terms of the setup. Setups also inflate the processing time uh, coefficient of variation. So, um, so here's the time TS square, and that's more adding that to the sigma square of the effective processing time. So all this is inflating the processing time and also this uh, measure of variability for the processing time. So in terms of observations, setups increase mean and variance of processing times. Variability re reduction is one benefit of having flexible machines. So if you don't have to perform as many setups and you can just switch between machines without having to perform all these setups, that can help you reduce the variability of your process. Uh, however, the interaction is, is complex. So let's look at this example. Here we have the fast inflexible machine with two hours set up every 10 jobs. And we have a slower flexible machine with no setups. So we can compute um, this um, using these uh, parameters. We have the time. Um, T0 is the time, mean process time. We have the number of jobs between setup equal to 10. TS uh, is the time of the setup. And then using that information, we can compute TE, which is T0 plus TS divided by NS, 1.2 hours. And RE is the effective capacity rate, which is going to be 1 over TE. So in this case, that's about 0.83 jobs an hour. For a slower flexible machine with no setups, we have the T0 to be higher, 1.2 hours. Here's was one hour. Um, and the effective uh, capacity rate is gonna be one over T0, which is the same. Uh, so fast and flexible machine and slower flexible machine with no setups giving you the same effective uh, rate. With tradition analysis, there's no difference, right? So that's what we just showed. Um, but let's compare the mean and the variance. For the fast inflexible machine with two hours setup every 10 jobs, and we, we have uh, T0 equals one hour. I'm giving you this um, coefficient of variation, uh, Z0 square, where you can compute that by using sigma square divided by T0 square. In this case, that's given. 10 jobs between setups, time of setup is two hours. And um, the coefficient of variation square for the setup is also given. So we can compute the um, mean process time of the job using the setups. That will be equal to 1.2 hours. Um, the effective capacity rate, we show that that's 0.83 already, uh, but we can compute sigma square of the effective processing time by substituting these numbers into this equation. And that will be equal to 0.4475. And remember that C E square equals sigma E square divided by uh, T E square. So if we substitute TE square and sigma E square into this equation, we get that the coefficient, square coefficient of variation of the effective processing time is 0.31. Okay, so that's again, trying to measure the variability of the system. Uh, so for a fast inflexible machine with two hours set up every 10 jobs, that T square is 0.31. If we look at the 
uh, the slower flexible machine and we compute the RE. We did already 0.83 jumps an hour. The effective coefficient of variation, since we have no setup in this one, will be equal to zero squared, which is 0.25. So what this conclusion or what this is telling to, to show is that having flexibility in your system can reduce the variability. And in addition to that, since you are reducing the, the variability, you should get be able to get a better throughput cycle time for your system. Okay, so this is looking again at the um, setup example. Um, so consider a third machine, same as the previous machine, with setup but with shorter, more frequent setups. So instead of being setups every ten jobs, now we have five jobs set up, and the time to perform the setup is one hour. We go through the same analysis. We still have 0.83 jobs an hour. Uh, sigma E squared is 0.33, 23.50. And the coefficient of variation squared for the effective processing time is 0.16. So what this is showing is that shorter, more frequent setup induces less variability also into the system. Okay, so shorter, more frequent setups induce less variability into, into the system. So what are the other things that we can highlight based on this discussion? Other process variability inflators include uh, operator on unavailability, recycling, batching, material on availability, among others. So there will be a lot of sources of variability. What are the effects? They inflate the effective processing time and they'll also inflate the coefficient of variation. So consequences, uh, effective process variability can be lower variability, moderate variability, or high variability. And as we show you, there are certain scenarios that we can show in which there are better things that uh, can reduce variability and can create a, a performance improvement into your system. So in summary, of all the formulas that we have discussed this afternoon, here's a summary. Um, we have this table of formulas for computing effective processing time parameters. Uh, we have the parameters or the situation in which you have natural variability. We have the situation with preemptive variability and the situation with non preemptive variability. And we provide an example with reliable machines, random failures, and setup and rework. So, all these formulas that we discussed today, they're listed here again. Or this is a good table for you to, to remember. If you want to put this into a formula sheet, that that will be uh, something that I would advise. Uh, so you can follow up the discussion that is going to continue after this lecture. Uh, any questions?